Hi, this is Dane Quinn from the University of Akron, and today's video lecture will deal with the loop closure equation for mechanisms. So, when we look to model mechanisms or machines, the kinematics are determined from what we call the loop closure equation. So, really that's a set of mathematical equations that describe the links, and here we have a four-bar linkage, right? So it would describe the four links in blue, gray, red, and then of course the ground link. The connections between those links, right? So the fact that, for example, this blue link is pinned to the gray link, and the constraints of the system. So, for example, the fact that the gray link has a fixed length. Right? So these are all constraints of the system, and this loop closure equation seeks to capture that. Right? So, in particular, we identify what we refer to as independent closed kinematic chains. So what are those? Well, we look for loops in the structure of the linkage. For example, in this picture, and so here I've, I've basically uncolored the linkage so I can draw on it better, I might identify a vector from O2 to A, and then there's another vector from A to B, and then finally another vector from B to O4, and then I can close that loop with a vector from O4 to O2. So when we do this, we end up generating vector equations. So remember our lecture on vectors. Vectors have magnitude and orientation. And so our vector equations essentially have terms that are all vectors. Now because they're vectors, and this becomes relatively important, each planar vector equation so all of our kinematics that we're looking at currently are in the plane. So each planar vector equation provides two scalar equations. So again, vectors in the plane have two independent components and corresponding vector equations have two independent scalar equations that are kind of built in. Right, so for this linkage, right, we might say the vector from O2 to A, so that's A with respect to O2, plus B with respect to A, plus O4, with respect to B, and then finally closing this loop, O2 with respect to O4 equals zero. Notice again that all of these terms are vectors. Now oftentimes when we write vector loop closure equation for four of our linkages, I will actually, I'll, I'll show you how I would typically do it in red, all right? I might go from O2 to A, and then A to B, and set that equal to the vector from O2 to O4, and then O4 to B. It's the same vector equation, it's just sort of organized slightly different. So we might A with respect to O2, B with respect to A equals O4 with respect to O2 plus B with respect to O4. So really, both sides of this vector equation describe the position of B. On the left side, we're moving through point A, and again, that constraint that pins these two links together. 
And on the right side, we're moving through O4. And the constraint that pins link 4 to the ground. Right, so either one of these two things is, uh, they're identical. Notice that when I move this vector over to the right hand side, it becomes the, the position of O4 with respect to O2. So let's look at a couple of other examples of loop closure equations. In particular, we just did a four bar linkage. The other common one that we will look at is a slider crank mechanism. Right, so here, kind of doing the same thing, we describe the vector from O2 to A, plus the vector from A to B, and that equals the vector from B to O2. Right, so here, this loop closure equation, we could write A with respect to O2, plus position of B, with respect to A equals the position of B with respect to O2. Now here, notice that this slider is designed in such a way that it only allows motion in the horizontal direction. So here the constraint is that the vertical displacement of the vector from O2 to B is always constant. So if I'm going to write this vector, I really want to take advantage of that. And so I might identify a point C down here that is in line with the slider. And then I could identify this displacement and that displacement. So as a result, I might choose to write the vector from O2 to B as the position of C with respect to O2 plus the position of B with respect to C. So now this is actually a constant vector and this has constant direction but varying magnitude. So again, when we write these loop closure equations, we really want to try to take advantage of the constraints of the problem. So now down here I've given you uh, some more complicated mechanisms. So what might be the loop closure equations that we would write for, for these mechanisms? So let's look at this mechanism on the left. This is actually a one degree of freedom mechanism, right? but it's fairly complicated. It actually has two closed kinematic chains in, that are inside it. So I can write the loop closure equations, and in this case there would be two of them, in the following way. Right, so let's start off and, and go from O2 to A, A to D, and that's going to be equal to the vector from O2 to O5, and then O5 to D. So here, that would be position of A with respect to O2, plus the position of D with respect to A, equals the position of O5 with respect to O2 plus the position of D with respect to O5. Right, so that's a closed kinematic chain. It's actually a four bar linkage. And then kind of built on top of that, we have this extra piece with another link and a slider. So that's gonna get its own kinematic chain because this part is independent of what's going on out here. All right, so let's see. Let's do that one in green. So I'll, actually I'll start here at O5. So I'll go O5 to D, D to B, B to C, equals, and let's do kind of a, a different green, the vector from O5 to C. All right, so here we have the vector from O5 to D plus R of B with respect to D plus R of C with respect to B equals the position of C 
with respect to O5. And in this case, this light green vector, I would probably represent this as a component in the I direction, which is constant, and then a component in the J direction, which has varying length. Again, that represents the constraint imposed by this slider. Now, you could also say, what about uh, a, a link or a closed chain from O2 all the way out here to C? Well, you could use that too. But if I wrote that one down, it would actually not be an independent additional loop, right? I could form the vector from O2 to C by going O5 to O2 and then to A and then to D, right? Which actually is this green vector from D to O5. So here we only have two independent kinematic loops, even though I might have, be able to identify several different kinematic chains. In a, in a given problem. So now let's look at the one on the right. This is actually a two degree of freedom problem. And really it just has one loop closure equation, one closed chain. And that's going to be the vector from O2 to A, and then A to B, and then B to C, and C to O5, and we'll put that last one in, and again, kind of a light green, is the vector from O2 to O5. So writing that out, we would say the position of A with respect to O2 plus the position of B with respect to A plus the position of C with respect to B plus the position of O5 with respect to C is the position of O5 with respect to O2. So now we have one kinematic chain, one closed loop for this two degree of freedom mechanism. You might ask, what about this extra bit from C to D? Well, that really doesn't influence the kinematics of the linkage. For example, if you made this part longer, if you, you extended this link, the kinematics of this chain would still stay the same. Right? So even though this is part of the mechanism, it's kind of unimportant to the kinematics. So these loop closure equations really just describe the important part of the mechanism. They describe the constraints and the connections between links. So, again, that's just kind of an overview, a brief introduction to loop closure equations. We will have to identify these so that we can then go and formulate position equations and ultimately velocity acceleration and just general kinematic equations for mechanisms. So that's it. Thanks so much, and I will talk to you again. Bye.